I have the distinct privilege of, of having a career where I get that reward and I get those endorphins and, and not everybody has that. And so sometimes people try to matter in a fairly nefarious way. Welcoming to Knocking Doors Down, my favorite redhead in entertainment. Sorry, Nicole Kidman. Steve Hofstetter, what's going on, good sir? That is quite the accomplishment to, <laughs> to surpass Nicole Kidman. So um, I'll take it. Well, she was kind of maybe close to passing, you know, she got that accent and I love that shit. But uh, now you went out. I, I like Amy Adams better than myself, but fair. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we talked before we started recording, we, you know, you went through, uh, COVID, but, uh, the big casino, the big casino. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, I went through it in the easiest way anyone can go through it. So I, uh, you know, thankfully relatively healthy, masked up, boosted. I was, I was okay. I mean, I still, I still wouldn't want more of it, but you know, sure. that was fine. Science works. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, kind of to jump back to a story, Steve and I have known each other close to 20 years. Um, but uh, I think when my alcoholism really first started, uh, <laughs> it was taking off, so to speak. And I went to see Steve live. First night, I got so shit ass drunk. My friends had to take me to a car where I passed out and puked. Came back the second night, highly hung over, but enjoyed a show. And you dropped some knowledge on me about you not drinking. And it's not really something you talk about, but there was a struggle there at one time. Well, I, you know, I, I've certainly been, it's not something I've talked about on stage. Um, you know, I mentioned it here and there, but, um, you know, I have talked about it on social media a bit and it, I was never an alcoholic. I was never close to being an alcoholic, but I could definitely see it getting in the way of what I wanted out of life. Mm -hmm, right. And so, you know, it, it was something where like, I, I was still certainly on the, you know, on the highway, but I could see the off ramp. And so, <laughs> right. um, it, it was something where I decided, you know, I had gone through that and, and everybody who drinks does the, the idea of, oh, I'm never going to drink again. And then the next weekend you're out drinking. Right. Um, and so, you know, I had said that a couple of times and then finally there was once where I said I was going to stop drinking and then uh you know a couple days later i had an event where i you know knew the people who were hosting it and like someone tossed me a beer and i was just like oh you know i'm trying not to drink and no one respects trying not to drink mm -hmm. people respect when you put your foot down and you say oh no i don't drink everybody's fine oh but if you say oh i don't want to have any i'm i'm trying to drink less uh, you know i've had enough tonight nobody respects that and so i did have the one beer and then I ended up having a really wonderful night and I realized that like that beer didn't change anything. I could have had a great night without it. And that was the last beer I ever had. I'll be damned. Well, I'm glad <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't to an extreme, uh, uh, you know, in so many of us addicts case. Kind of no, it, it was more of a, uh, you know, I was, I was losing time each morning. You, you know, when you're a comic, it's so easy to drink. It's, sure. A lot of times the venue provides it. If the venue doesn't provide it, people after the show want to buy you a drink um, or during the show sometimes too. And, you know, you do the math and you go, oh, if, you know, I do a show for 200 people and, you know, 20 of them want to buy me a drink, I'll die. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's bad. Um, and, it, you know, it comes to the point where you're pretty much drinking every day of the week. And even if it's not, you know, really harming me at night, I wake up the next day, I'm slower, I'm not feeling well, I'm not accomplishing things. And it's such a difficult profession already that putting a hurdle in front of you during a race doesn't make you run faster. So mm -hmm. I took the hurdles away. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you stand up there with the microphone and just you. That's it. And you got to well, entertain. Make me laugh. Go. <laughs> it's not even that it's, you know, performing is the easiest part of this business. The, the toughest part is getting the opportunity to, yeah, and, you know, and, and being able to do the business of it and, you know, reply to emails at, or send emails that'll never get replies and, you know, call people and, and work on your social media. Now, you know, back then there wasn't such a thing, but, 
Um, it's a, it's a business that requires you to be firing on all cylinders most of the time. And so, I mean, there aren't a lot of jobs that you can drink at work and still do your job correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. so why, why do I think mine is one of them? Well, and I'm sure throughout the, you know, there's been so many comedians that have died of addiction related issues. You know, some yeah. of my favorites, I, I, I can't imagine maybe what it's like being out there on the road. I, I think people don't understand the mental and emotional toll that it takes out there on the road. I mean, you have a family at home, you leave them, you know. Yeah. Jo uh, John Panette was talking about being sober once and it was it was something that really stuck with me where he said, because someone asked him, I forget who was interviewing him, but the the interviewer asked, you know, why do so many comedians have an alcohol problem? And he said, well, you know, when you're at a motel in Topeka, if you have a half a bottle of Jack in you, you forget that you're at a motel in Topeka. <laughs> and it's like, it is a very lonely existence. It is a very, and it's better now that, you know, we are so connected as a society because, you know, I started doing the road when, you know, texting was really just getting going. Um, but you could still call people all the time. It was real easy. But I talked to some of these older comics and they talk about the fact that like, you know, to, to get bookings, they would, they would get a whole bunch of quarters and go to the payphone and like just call bookers. And that to pass the time, they would, uh, Larry Reeb once told me, he was like, yeah, we'd mall walk. I go, what is that? And he goes, walking around a mall. I was like, very <laughs> aptly named. Uh, but they would literally just try to do that to kill time during the day. Whereas now, you know, I never have a second free. And on one hand, it's more stressful. But on the other hand, it's less isolating. Is that something that early on, that, that isolation that you struggled with or that you saw maybe other comedians struggle with? Absolutely, I did. And, you know, and it, and it wasn't just not having a way to, you know, communicate to people as much as we can now. It was also, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I really put my foot down and I said, I'm always doing gigs with my friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you are, when something goes wrong on the road, which it always does, you know, our running joke on my last tour was, you know, like what can, what can go wrong? You know, it's, it, we always, we said it's always something. Right. And, you know, and sometimes that's uh, the sound system is fritzing out or or there was once where we got to a place where we had a sold out show and their POS system was down. <laughs> so they couldn't sell any beer or food and they were like, we're going to cancel the show. I'm like, we're absolutely not. Learn how to take cash. Yeah. You know, yeah. like th there's an ATM around the corner. Tell people to go get cash. We're not canceling. The we're not going to lose money because you guys are going to lose money. This isn't our fault. Mm -hmm. Um. And when that happened, like, yeah, it sucked at the time, but then we laughed about it the next day. And when you're touring by yourself, you don't have that. Right. So, you know, really what helped my mental health more than anything was, and at first it was, and, and even sometimes still it's, you know, you lose a little bit of money doing it because when the club books, the openers, they put them up, they pay them, they, you know, et cetera. And when, I book my guys, first of all, I'm not going to pay them as little as the club would be willing to pay them, but also I have to fly them out there. I have to travel them. I have to, you know, et cetera. And so there was a gig that I did where it was a five day long gig and the opener was doing all these jokes that were just so sexist and racist and just, I never wanted to hang out with someone less than that. Right. And that was the last time I let a venue book an opener for me. And and they were willing to let me bring an opener. It was just kind of a, re a remote place. And it, it was, I, I decided, oh, it's not financially worth it. And I'm like, no, no, no. I will lose $300 to not have to talk to this person. <laughs> so, yeah. And that, that was a huge change for me. Do you look back at that now with your career and all the work that you put in on the road? Cause you're 24 years doing stand up? No, no, no. Way less than that. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, I'm uh, 18 or 19. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I got, I got to do the math, but I think, uh, I think I'm in my 19th year right now. Okay. I don't know why I thought before, prior to you and I meeting, you had been at it for about four or five years, but do no, you no, I was, I was pretty new. Oh shit. Right on. Now, do you reflect back looking at the your career? And as you said, like, Hey, I've worked so hard to build what my quote unquote brand is and my style that it's just like, 
like you said, I'm not willing to compromise who and what I am and be connected to what I think is a total bullshit approach to this brilliant art form. Well, I mean, I've always thought, I've always thought that I don't want to compromise, you know, early on, I was working with a comic named Phil Palisol, who's great. And he, you know, he took me to lunch and he was, he said that the thing he liked about my set was that his phrase was, I dropped the comedy plow. He was like, you don't, he's like, you don't care what the field looks like. You are, you're going to plow the field regardless. And that's something that, you know, stuck with me, but also something that I found really important to me is that like, there are people who, um, I think the greatest example of it was, um, I, I was on this Facebook thread where a bunch of comics were talking about, you know, someone was trying to make the point of stay out of politics when you're talking about comedy because, or when you're doing comedy, because, you know, you might piss people off and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, weird, I got into comedy to say something. Right. Like, I don't know why you got into comedy. Do you get into comedy for a paycheck? There are way better ways to make a paycheck. Yeah. Like I, I got into comedy to say something. I got, I got into art to create art mm -hmm. and I didn't get into art to please an art critic. So like, and, and if you do, you'll never, you'll never do anything. There's, um, there's that quote from uh, Bloxy Blues, uh, when you compromise your art, you become a candidate for mediocrity. And speaking of uh, getting into art, getting into comedy, when you were, how did you get into it? When you were a kid, were you always just the were you the class clown, or were you like, you know what, I, I like this. This is I could I could do something like this. Not even remotely. Um, <laughs> I I got into comedy because when I was thirteen and I was a, a very lost, shy kid, mm -hmm. um, I got convinced to join the improv club by a, a girl I had a crush on. Oh, okay. And I just, I just thought it was so wonderful that she thought I was funny enough or interesting enough to join that club. Like to me, it was such this moment of someone recognizes something in me and someone who I have put value upon recognizes something in me. And so um, I joined it and I was very hesitant at first, but they had this rule where newbies always had to do a scene uh -huh. and I did. And it was so much fun. I loved it. And within two weeks, she had quit and I was already hooked and it didn't matter that she was gone. I was I was in. Yeah, and it was it was just it was the first time in my life I was getting positive attention for something. Nice. Uh, how do you deal with, you know, and I think a lot of people that are they are listening to our podcast, um, you know, that have struggled with addiction, feel that shyness, that isolation, uh, not fitting in and everything else. One of the things I love about following you on social media, Steve, is People just can't hit you with any arrows and daggers. How did you just build up that mental and emotional capacity? To just be like, <laughs> just fuck them, <laughs> whatever guy. I, I don't know. Well, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not impervious. I'm not a robot. I definitely have moments where things hurt, but I think the key is don't take someone else's demons personally. I think yeah. it takes a lot of ego to think that this horrible person is only horrible at me. Yeah. Like this is, this is an insufferable person. This is a person who, if they're willing to say that kind of thing to a stranger, what do they say to the people in their life? Mm -hmm. And to, to think that their demons are a reflection on you is ego. Um, sure. And you have to put that aside and realize that like, no, this person just sucks. And like that, that doesn't change who I am because they suck toward me. <laughs> like it's just i just happen to be i just you know happen to be uh in firing range that's all it is no i totally get that we uh jason and i will talk and you know there will be some i don't read the comments anymore but when, at the time that i did there was just some horrible things horrible comments you know like directed at our guests or directed at jason and myself and i'm just like fuck that i'm responding fuck that and then i'm just like no 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 no. okay we'll stop we'll stop and then my sister and i had a conversation about it and she was just like mikey it's not about you it's about them they're clearly just a miserable person and you must be doing something right for them to just get on to talk shit to you guys when they don't even know you and i'm just like you know what you're absolutely right yeah there's so much there's so much in there i mean 
one of the things is no matter what position you take on something, someone's going to disagree with you. Sure. You know, if you say, if you say that you love dogs, someone else is a cat person. If you say that, you know, you love a sunny day, someone's like, what about the rain? Like someone we will need always it. You need the rain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Someone will always disagree with you no matter what it is that you say. And if no one disagrees with you, that means you're not saying anything. Right. Um, right. And there are also people who will say, oh, never read the comments. I disagree. First of all, respond to the comments. That's how the algorithm works. Like if you're going to have social media, pay attention to the science. Mm -hmm. But also, aside from that, just mentally people, oh, you'll, you'll get exhausted reading the comments. It's like only if you put as much weight, only if you put more weight in the bad comments than you do in the good ones. Mm -hmm. If you understand that the majority of it is overwhelmingly positive, right. great. Um, also, the comments help you learn sometimes. Like there have been things that I've posted where I didn't understand an angle on it. And, you know, enough people said something or the right person said something the right way that it struck a chord with me. Sure. And I learned. And it, you also learn why your followers or your fans like what they like. You know, you if if it weren't for the comments, you know, I wouldn't understand what to do necessarily as an artist because I wouldn't understand what moves people. I get that. That makes sense. It's a different way. I haven't looked at yet. Yeah. But yeah. But I was so again, I'm like, no comments. Absolutely not. But you saying that I get that. But, but also I do want to stress that like, it can be mentally taxing and For I do sure. understand that. And one of the things that I make sure to do is I want my social media to be the positive place for my fans. Mm -hmm. And so I, and, and anyone I have deputized to be a moderator, we're very quick with a ban hammer because if you make my page a difficult place to be for other people, I don't care how much, you know, controversy you're generating and therefore gets more views and all that stuff. I have made the decision to make it a positive place for my fans. Mm -hmm. And so if someone's being a dick, whether it's to me or to someone else, Hey, you're not welcome here. That's not what this is. Well, and it, it goes back, I think, to that being uh, mentally and emotionally in a good and healthy place. It, you know, so many people right now, I think, and especially having gone through this pandemic, I'm seeing it worse of people seeking attention no matter what it is in any way, shape, or form, and not really taking yeah. a look over at the whole. And like you said, that that ego thing. I know it. Well, I know it was for me very fragile ego, and you know, I couldn't talk to a girl unless I was two or three, you know, pints in or whatever it is. And I remember, so like early days of people using the internet. Mm -hmm. I was still in high school, so I was seventeen. This would have been. This would have been probably, you know, spring 97. And I remember how excited I was to show a friend of mine. I had posted in a news group in like a baseball news group. And, you know, there were two or three responses, but, you know, having a conversation. I remember how excited I was to show a friend of mine that. And it's, you know, it was the equivalent of, you know how people get excited when like you're at a you're at a Best Buy or something and one of the video cameras is set up so that you see what's on the TV? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And people get excited about, oh look, I'm on TV. It was like that kind of dumb thing. But I look at that and I look at how human that was. And while I look back and I go, Oh, that's so stupid. Anybody can post anything now. Back then it was tougher and and it was it was the first time I had seen that. And so I do understand the instinct that a human has of, hey, look at how many people are discussing something because of me, even if that discussion is hateful, even if, you know, et cetera. And so I do get where that comes from. And it comes from the instinct of, you know, the three, get a little more philosophical here, the three basic human instincts are survival of the self, survival of the species, and then mattering. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of figured out the first two for the most part. They're obviously, they're marginalized groups that don't have it as easy as everyone else. But we're not worried the species is gonna go away, except you know for climate change, but not in our lifetimes. And most of us don't worry about our survival on a daily basis. You walk to the store and get a sandwich, you're not worried you're gonna die on the way. And so now our focus has become mattering. 
Right. And for some people, mattering happens in our careers. And for some people, mattering happens in our families. And for some people, mattering happens by joining an HOA and telling people how high they can cut their grass. <laughs> you, you must know my neighborhood. Exactly. That is, but to that person, that's them mattering. Right. And so I understand that I have, I have the distinct privilege of, of having a career where I get that reward and I get those endorphins and, and not everybody has that. And so sometimes people try to matter in a fairly nefarious way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, and we definitely see it quite often. Um, gosh, I just had a brain fart. You got off onto a wonderful thing. There was something in there that I was. That, ask. That's okay. I mean, if we're, if we're talking, if we're talking mental health, like one of the things we could talk about is something that I have not addressed much. Um, it w- it was something that I, I wrote one post about it because I just needed people to back off. And it was, uh, this past year, um, you know, and, and everybody's gone through a lot in the last two years. Um, but it was th- this past year has been really the first time that I'm dealing with people being demanding of me. Mm. You know, the, the difference in at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, I had 200,000 followers on Facebook and now I have 700,000. I had 30,000 on Instagram and now I have 130,000. Like it's a, I had zero on TikTok and now I have 400,000. Like it's, it's a, I'm, I'm in a different place than I was in then. And there are, most people have been absolutely wonderful, but there are people who don't understand the difference between someone on a screen and someone in front of them. Mm-hmm. And so I was dealing with a lot of people demanding things of me that I hadn't been used to before. And especially because I take the pandemic seriously and not everybody does. And so people will get mad at me. Why won't you hug me? I'm like, I'm not even going to shake your hand, which by the way, I don't think I'll ever shake hands again. It's the best. Just right. elbow bump. I haven't had a cold in two years, but uh, <laughs> Japanese the, had it right. Bow. It, hell yeah. yeah. Although by the way, little tangent, I once saw someone cause that's supposed to show humility, but I once saw two people, I was in Japan and I saw two people get into a bow off. <laughs> where like they needed the last bow to show just how humble they were. And I'm like, you're both being dicks. <laughs> and then, and then they finished. And then the guy who wasn't last kind of, as he started walking away, just turned and just kind of gave like a quick little bow. And I'm like, that guy's the bigger dick. <laughs> anyway, um, it was something where there was this stretch on tour in mid August where it was the first time in my life that I was dealing with anxiety. I've always been very lucky in that, you know, I know a lot of anxiety and depression is based on chemical imbalance Mm -hmm. and I was lucky to not have that, but people can change and also external factors can influence it. And so I started dealing with anxiety for the first time and I had no idea how to deal with it. And I found myself getting very quick to anger, which is not me at all. And like, I'm a fairly even keeled, like, all right, let's talk this through kind of person. And there was this moment where it was my show in New York and I'm from there. It's my home. It's like my homecoming show. I'm playing the Gramercy theater. I'm so excited. My name's on the damn marquee outside. And this is like a very highly trafficked area near where I used to hang out as a kid. You know, I mean, it's just so exciting. And I get there and one of the security guys and obviously he's new there but one of the security guy go you know one of the security guys you know is like oh the doors aren't open yet i go oh no hey i'm i'm steve and instead of saying oh welcome to the gramercy you know or oh happy to have you like someone in that position should have done in that job that is the part of what you do in that job um instead he still treated me like i wasn't supposed to be there and patted me down and just really made me feel like i was intruding and i had this well of anger where i wanted to be like what the fuck are you doing you know and like and which is not something i would ever do i understand he's got a difficult job he probably just started that job it's just after the pandemic i'm sure they were short staffed and and restaffing and and all the logic in me didn't want to do that But there's this emotion in me that wanted to and i stopped myself and i just you know kind of nodded and i walked in and i realized this is a problem Mm -hmm. like i'm not someone who reacts like that i'm not someone who treats people poorly because of their job even if they're fucking up their job which he was doing 
I just still, you know, normally would just be like, Hey man, thanks. Have a good one. You know? And I felt anger instead. And I realized that like, this is a significant problem and I need to do something about it. Now, what is it that, what have you done about it? What are like some daily practices that, that, that have worked for you? Please tell us because yeah. I have anxiety like a motherfucker. So yeah, I would love to hear how you, what you did. 13 one, years strong here. <laughs> one is I, first of all, I have, the reason I posted about it was to set boundaries with my fans and mm. to, you know, and to be clear about those boundaries. And I stick to those boundaries. Um, it's something where I, I'm not going to let someone bully me into a situation where I know I'm going to feel anxiety. Yeah. Um, and part of that is figuring out your triggers and understanding what it, what is it that pushes you over that edge? What is it that brings you up to that edge and trying not to put yourself in a situation that would bring you there? I, I am lucky to be in the position of my career now where I can have a little bit of a buffer between things, but I also decided, and, and this is a very specific one in my situation where for 20, almost 20 years, I've been doing, you know, meet everybody after the show, take pictures, sign if anybody wants to sell merch, et cetera. And, you know, part of that was survival because I needed to sell t-shirts to get gas money, but it was also, I always loved being accessible. And I realized now that I can't do that anymore. It's, it's a trigger for me. Yeah. And so I've decided I'll do like a meet and greet before a show. And aside from that, that's it. You know, I'm no longer going to sit there after a show where someone lectures me for 10 minutes about one particular joke they didn't like, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to let someone do that anymore. Oh, that would be annoying. Oh, it's the worst. But I mean, I shouldn't say the worst. It sucks. Mm -hmm. But I do that because that also gives it also gives me the opportunity to have the good conversations. And so I deal with the bad ones to have the good ones. But I've realized that like it's too it's it's been hurting me too much to have the bad ones. And so I am going to, you know, I have to put up those walls. Right. And um, I also, my friends that are on tour with me all know, and, you know, they, they know to try to prevent situations that will put me in a bad state the same way that I'll do that for them. You know, one of the comics I tour with, um, you know, can get angry fairly quickly and, I know what typically sets him off and I do what I can to help him avoid that. And that's what you do for friends. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that certainly helps, but I, I think it really comes down to knowing your triggers, knowing your limits and trying to do what you can to avoid them. The, a big mistake I made was I had a past relationship where she dealt with anxiety and depression a lot. And I would always try to, you know, be the hero and fix things. And that's not how you do it because everyone needs to learn how to self soothe mm -hmm. and whether the thing that makes it better for you is, you know, is working out or whether it is playing a video game or whether it's a call with a specific family member or friend, whatever it is that, that reduces that for you, you need to find it. And that's not an easy thing. I'm not suggesting that it's easy but you need to be able to understand how to self-soothe. Absolutely. Yeah, none of this, uh, and I, I'm so glad you brought this up, Steve, especially boundaries. I know that inability to have them because of my trauma history resulted in me never having long-term sobriety until I was willing to set boundaries at all costs in my life. So it's so yeah. important that you bring that up because it is. Otherwise, you know, We'll continue to let people violate us at what cost? A cost to ourselves. Yeah. Know? And and most of the time, it's because someone is being selfish and they're just not considering how their actions affect other people. Um, just yesterday, I did a uh, I did a live stream on my Instagram. And, you know, I was taking questions. And that's the point of the live stream is that, you know, I give everybody, not everybody, but I, you know, one by one are like, Hey, what do you got for me? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And have these nice little conversations. And some of them were really, really lovely. And someone jumped in and started telling me about some political cause that she was doing. And it, it sounded offhand, like something that would be important to me, but I was like, Hey, now's not really the time for this. You know, if I'm going to get involved in a cause, I need to research it. And she started being like, well, we have a mutual friend. I'm like, I already said now's not the time for this. And then she kept trying to say it. And I just took her off the stream. 
Because I was like, I don't care how important this cause is. You're not listening to me. And this is something where like, you want to send me a message about this? Absolutely. We have a mutual friend, have them approach me. But don't just bully your way into something. And one thing that I appreciated is a lot of the comments in the chat were like, kind of way to go set your boundaries. Because I think a lot of people do struggle with that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not something that's easy for me either, but it's something that's important to me. And it's something that I've learned, you know, whatever those boundaries are, and obviously be a reasonable human being, you know, your boundaries shouldn't be like, I only take phone calls between 615 and 617. Like that's, <laughs> you're not going to get phone calls. You're going to, you know, not have friends, but the, <laughs> but when you need to put a wall up, put the wall up and hold to it because making a compromise doesn't, making a compromise on your own mental health doesn't help anybody. And I think it goes back to those three aspects that you were talking about earlier. And oftentimes, you know, the, the willingness to allow boundaries to be pushed or whatever, go, I think goes back to that ego fill, that, that empty thing of ego that, it, it, I mean, it, I don't know. Ego is real in certain areas, but for the most part, it's bullshit, you know? So, yeah. um, I, I don't know. What do you think? I think a lot of people that so much that allowance of boundaries being pushed is ego. You know, I could see it maybe in your situation, like after the show, look at this 400 people want to take pictures with me or whatever else. And you're like, fuck, I don't care. You know, I've got what I need for my mental health to be able to go out and do the next show and the next show and the next show. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I've seen straight up celebrities like need the adoration. And I'm like, this is weird to me because like, you you know, how big is the hole that you need to fill that what you already have isn't enough of it. Um, But everybody has their demons. And, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to learn to do is to to try to understand that about other people. And I can't expect the person who has most of the stuff from post-show comes from unrealistic expectations. It comes from someone like, like there are people who will insist on trying to tell me a joke after a show. (laughs) And, you know, it'll always be like, Oh, I got a joke for you. And I stop them and I go, please don't. It has never gone well. Oh, come on. This is great. I go, but you haven't heard mine. (laughs) Exactly. It's like, Hey, I'm sure I have and B it's not going to go well. And you know, the people who get it are oh, okay. You know, but the people who don't are, they don't get it because they have this unrealistic unre- expectation of, Oh, they're going to tell me this internet joke and then I'm going to find them funny. And then we're going to be buddies and then we're going to go hang out in Bali together. And I'm like, I've never been to Bali, <laughs> but the, it, it's an unrealistic expectation of what you can get out of a basic conversation. Now, it would be unrealistic for me to expect that that person will figure that out that quickly. Right. And so the only way I can be okay is to remove myself from that situation. And I can't expect them to understand my boundaries. They already have proven that they don't. So I just need to set tighter boundaries and set boundaries that they cannot break. Um, Now that said, I also want to be clear. I'm a big fan of the idea of pushing your comfort zone in order to allow you to be more comfortable with more things, but not when it comes to a trigger, Mm -hmm. not when it comes to something that you know hurts you. Um, The fear of something that doesn't actually hurt you. It's the, you know, so if it's something where like, oh, I'm not going to ask out this person that I have a crush on because what if they say no, that's something where it's like, get out of your, get out of your comfort zone for a second and, you know, send a text or make a phone call or, you know, walk up to the person in line or wh- whatever the hell it is. Um, but because that fear is artificial that you've created in your head. Um, but that said, if you know that rejection sets you off, well, then you need to learn how to deal with that and you need to go through therapy or whatever else it is uh, so that you can handle that. Um, I, I do think that strong boundaries are important, but also understanding what is a real boundary for you and what is an artificial shell that you're just stuffing yourself in. I think that's also important. 
with all that being some... said, you should probably throw your list of jokes the way you're going to tell them. Oh, the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do was... appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> hoping maybe I could write for you. Or you guys are not going to uh, Bali. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, I. You know, Steve. I for me, it's definitely been the toxic relationships, friendships, and um, I. And I like what you said also too about pushing your comfort zone. I got another part of that, but for the toxic friendships relationships and it was someone that i was talking to is probably two three months back trying to keep a friendship of someone that was an ex and he goes hey dipshit was it toxic when you guys were together yeah yeah oh yeah why do you think the friendship's going to be any different <laughs> Fuck. yep my ego likes to tell me i'm this peaceful person and i can get along with everyone and then this guy is like hey johnny son of a bitch you don't have to like everyone and guess what not very many people like you and that's okay. And I'm like, thank you, Mikey. I never said not many people like you. You said it in a way that, yeah. that it's like, that's a <laughs> thing to what, say. what you know, what you essentially said in the way that I heard it and took it back and used it as my own is people don't care about you as much as you care about them. And that's okay. Mm. Well, but also people don't care about you as much as you care about them caring about you. Wait, wait, yeah. say that again. Yeah. People Slower. don't care about you as much as you care about them caring about you. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Like the same way that the same way that people are like, oh no, I, I can't wear this shirt. I wore this shirt to the, the last time I saw this person three weeks ago. And it's like, that person doesn't know that. Just so you know, that That's person true. does not have a mental image of you in that shirt. Stop it. Like what pictures though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was photographed in this already. Damn it. I need another new. Sh I need to get another yeah. one. I can't there get on a video with the same shirt or hat. And it's like me. I got the same shit. Oh, well. yeah. There was a, um, there was actually a paragraph that I fought for in my book that my editor wanted to take out where mm -hmm. I, cause my book is about getting bullied in high school and right. in it, I talk about, you know, I, I talk about how I was complicit in my bullying because I cared. I cared so much what they thought of me. And she was saying that that's victim blaming. And I'm like, no, that's explaining to people why you have the, the struggles that you have. It's understanding that if you do, it's a solution. Right. It's, you know, it's finding the root of the problem. It is removing the tumor. And so... I, I do think that giving other people that power is one of the things that can make life so difficult for you. And when I say you, I don't mean you specifically, I mean, everyone, mm -hmm. right. um, you know, there was a, there was a moment where, and oh man, I was, so, I cared so much about what people thought of me growing up. And there was a moment where, you know, I'm walking with, I mean, with my best friend and we're in St. Louis and it is two degrees out. Yeah. And I put on these like, you know, those stupid band earmuffs. Yeah. I, I had a pair of them and I put them on and he's like, you look ridiculous. And I go, you're not covering your ears in two degrees. You look ridiculous. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, and he just kind of gave me a, all right, sure. But the, the confidence of being able to be like, yeah, I, I don't care. I'm doing this because I want to is I think very important and something that it took me a long time to get to. Mm -hmm. And it, it's something that I think a, a lot of people, especially younger people struggle with. Um, you need whatever, whatever that boundary is, whether that boundary is, Hey, asshole, I like this shirt, you know, or that, or that boundary is I can't talk to anybody right now because I'm in my head and just give me a minute, yeah. whatever that boundary is, you need to be able to set that. How did you deal with, because you, uh, I wouldn't believe that, that you were bullied because of the way that you handle people when you are on stage and own it. Yeah, uh, it seems very easy for you to just, dude, fuck off oh, to a bully. Well, <laughs> well, but Steve, you know, I know you may not follow his comedy like I do, Mikey, but he's just, you're one of the quickest wits I've ever seen on stage. I wouldn't believe that you were bullied, but how did you kind of reconcile that? Or is the art of comedy a good outlet for you for what that is that like taking that power for yourself well the the confidence i have now came from being on stage it's it's not something i had right away it's something that you know developed from the time i started doing improv when i was 13 
until, you know, I got to the point where I could regularly get laughs at will on stage. And it took a long time to get there. Um, you know, my smart mouth got me in trouble when I was a kid, partially because I've always had more of an adult sense of humor. When I say adult, I don't mean like dirty. I mean, like, you know, I thought puns were funny <laughs> and that's something. Yeah. Pun, a good pun is, is I love it, but the 13 year old doesn't. And so, um, I, the, there's a story I tell in the book where I was so bad, where, uh, one of my bullies was the Regina George of our school was named Scarlett. And there was this time where she confronted me because I had a crush on a friend of hers who was this popular girl. Now I didn't do anything about the crush. I just didn't hide it well because I was a dumb 13 year old kid who would change the subject every time her name came up and then stare at my feet, you know, you, you know, real slick stuff. And so everybody knew I liked her. So Scarlett confronts me in the hall and just yells at me for five minutes. Just how I dare I have the audacity to be an unpopular boy who liked a popular girl. Basically one of these, you shouldn't exist kind of things. And it was awful. And I was always quick, but the way I describe it is when you have a very fast computer, but no files on the computer, what does that speed get you? Mm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I was the youngest of four. We didn't have cable. I was basically raised on like old movies. Mm -hmm. And so there's this moment where she finishes yelling at me and I, it's like, everyone's listening. A crowd had gathered, you know, the standard high school movie trope was, is real. And there, you know, and, and it's my turn to say something back. And like, here's a moment where, where, you know, the, the zebra can take down the lion. And I say to her, frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn, which as an adult, what a line <laughs> as a 13 year old. Absolutely not. Like nobody heard me say that and was like, oh, you're gone with the wind, motherfucker. You know, like there was no, you've been Vivian laid out. Like, it's just like, it wasn't that it was just a bunch of people looked at me like, oh, it's a weird kid again. And then walked away. <laughs> And so having that, having the speed doesn't always help when you don't have anything to access. <laughs> right. So it took a while. It definitely took a while. And it also took a while to, uh, there's that movie Better Off Dead. I love that movie. And oh, gosh, there's, John Cusack was great. Man. Yeah, there's this moment in it where, you know, he's got this, he's got this old beat up car he never fixes and she helps him fix the car. And she basically says, like, you know, try success. You'll find you'll like the taste. Yeah. And, you know, helps him with this little car race and that helps him feel more confident. And it, it was that it was these little successes in life. And I started realizing, oh, I like the taste of this and, you know, and, and trusting yourself that you'll be able to get there again uh, helps a lot. So I, I thank you for saying that. But no, I was bullied pretty relentlessly because, like I said, I cared. And that was the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you switch that mindset of, of caring in, in that regard? Was, that, was there any work that you did? Have you done therapy? Are you kind of one of those self-teachers? I know you're a big reader and, you know. I, I tried therapy briefly, but I found myself, the therapist that I was with, I, I found myself having to re-explain the same things to her again. I'm like, don't you take notes? Like, how are you ever going to find a breakthrough if we start from scratch every time? And so it, it, that didn't help. But what helped for me was um, I am a very introspective person um, and not just, I don't just sit there and try to self-analyze. I talk with friends. I, you know, I, I want to learn from their issues, not just my own. And, you know, I try to observe, I try to, and, and so I have done the work, but it's not, and I'm continuing to do the work, but it's not, it's not that I do the work by, you know, seeing a traditional therapist or by, you know, sitting there with a journal. I, you know, I do the work by keeping my eyes open, by keeping my ears open, by paying attention and by being honest about, about the things that I'm doing wrong. And there, there are still things that I do that when I do it, I'm like, God, why do I still do that? You know, like you, you know that you have a problem with that sort of thing and you still find yourself in that old pattern. And maybe that's what therapy could help with me. But 
um, as long as you're always trying to strive. And it's part of why I don't like New Year's resolutions, because I think when you have a realization of what you want to make better, start it. You don't have to wait for, you don't have to wait to flip a calendar. No, I would agree with you there. Oh, well, Steve, I mean, I, I could talk to you for hours, but I know we got about an hour of your time. Um, before we get to some fun, random questions, and we like to have the guests leave us with some uh, kind of words of inspiration. Um, let people know a little bit more where they can find you on social media, the book and, and everything else. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, my brand new book is about to come out. Pre-orders are open now. Um, it's called Follow Your Dream Unless Your Dream is Stupid. And it's about... <laughs> thank you. I, I love it. <laughs> it's, it's about the first six years that I was a comic. And the, the basic, the book, aside from, you know, the actual stories that I tell of what happened, it's a basic exploration of like, how do you figure out whether or not your dream is stupid? And... Mm-hmm. Um, so you can get that right off my website, um, just stevehoffsetter.com and I'm at Steve Hofstetter on pretty much all social media. Um, I do, you know, a couple new videos a week, uh, of standup and then some vlogs as well. So check it all out. Yeah. I'm loving this stuff where you're doing you and, uh, it seems whomever you're touring with where you're on stage and taking stuff from the crowd and you were, Oh God, you were in, um, Alabama. I'm trying to remember what city and, and the guy yells out, uh, yeah, Google said this is the third best city oh. to live at in the country. And you guys just the way you, oh, you didn't tear the guy down. You tore down his lack of knowledge and what he was saying. And it was, it was uh, yeah. Huntsville, Huntsville Alabama. Huntsville. And yeah. it was, uh, and there are, there are lists you can find that say that, but they are like sponsored by Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> like it's, it's one of those things that it's just like, I'm sure on a scale according to somebody, but this isn't just well-known fact. This isn't just right. objective truth, man. Like this is, this, you, one of the things I said in the video was, uh, this may not even be the third best city to live in in Northern Alabama. <laughs> um, but it's uh but but part of part of why i do that actually that so that whole like bringing them on stage with me for the q a because i've been doing the q a forever but having them be part of it was something that i actually started doing because i was in a really bad place it was um one of my dogs was very sick it was a couple years ago and i knew he had to be put down and basically i knew it was the last week i had with him Mm -hmm. And I was not in a place where I could just be on stage by myself ad living. And I asked, it was a Brett Drock and Jared Berenstein. And I was like, will you guys, would you guys want to come up with me at the end? And they said, yes. And it was, it was a boundary thing. It was a protection thing. And it's become one of our favorite parts of the night. Now it's something that all the comics I tour with look forward to look like, cause it's just so fun to be up there together and, you know, the crowd likes it and, so it's, it's something that came from being honest with myself that I, I couldn't do it on my own. And yeah. so, you know, now I don't, I can, but I don't want to. It's interesting how, uh, what we see is maybe a negative or like you said, a way to, to cope with the time ends up becoming such an amazing positive gift. And sometimes we're a little too impatient to wait and see the results of what something actually is. Very well said. All right. Fun, random questions. Uncle Mikey, you're up first. All right. If they were to make a movie about you, who would you cast to play yourself? Um, anyone who's not redheaded just to throw people off. It, it <laughs> doesn't matter who they are. You know, it would be really fun. Dan and Radcliffe. Uh, so, cause people would have assumed that I would have cast Rupert Grint. So <laughs> just, we don't all look alike. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, all right. Um, if you could have uh, dinner with, just one person, anyone in history, alive or not, who would it be? Um, my dad. Yeah. Your dad was, uh, was who got you into baseball, right? Yeah. That's- my dad got me into baseball, got me into comedy. Um, and, you know, having one meal with someone you've never met before, just because you're interested in what they have to say, that doesn't do it for me because you can read a book about what they have to say. But I would like to be able to see my dad again. That's awesome. I didn't know your dad got you into comedy as well. Was it kind of, I know for me, my parents, it was, you know, the Steve Martin records and the Richard Pryor records in the house. And was it kind of that situation or did he actually sit with you? And it was that situation. It was Carlin and uh, it was funny. He liked Cosby and I never did. And I feel so vindicated. (laughs) Um, 
but the uh yeah he would just play that stuff for me and and uh you know then when i was i think i was 11 or 12 when that rolling stone article came out about bill hicks i mm -hmm. read it in a barber shop that again i was at with him while he was getting his haircut i was just reading a magazine and saw an article about comedy and i was like oh cool and yeah just but you know he introduced me to stand up and then you know and then we would watch uh comic strip live uh late at night so okay. you never liked cosby i never found him funny okay. i i mean the cosby show i enjoyed sure but sure. his stand up i never found his stand up funny i always found it to be so basic yeah can i and, i think he had one good joke there were individual jokes that i think were were good but i think so much of it was just really trite and maybe at the time it was groundbreaking but by the time i heard it i was like yeah i've heard these jokes from eight other people yeah can i tell you who i think and it's no disrespect they had a great career in my opinion doesn't fucking matter because they don't care they're you know whatever i have the same feeling about jerry seinfeld i feel like he is extremely overrated i don't think he's funny and i never have i like I, the jerry seinfeld one of my favorites yeah. um and i think that what seinfeld did better than anybody was go five or six layers deep into something there's a thought that we all have mm -hmm. and the premise of the joke is something that we've all thought about but going further deep like he's one of my favorite things from him was because it was just it was just one of these things it's like holy crap i can't believe no one's ever talked about this before but the idea of like birds flying into a mirror and it's like wouldn't they avoid the other bird like they they understand you know you understand they don't know that's not another room but there's another bird coming right at them <laughs> right um and then there was another joke that i love about how we get we all get more progressive each generation mm -hmm. and this, this is something that i've wondered but the way that he put it was so great where he said that you know what's it going to be you know when i have grandkids like oh do you remember when dogs couldn't vote and it's just such a i really enjoyed that i really enjoyed the idea of that jump and i just i don't know i've i've always i've always found his i mean aside from the fact that i love the show sure yeah. I, no i, I love this george costanza kramer yeah of course but like I don't, his stand-up just never did it for me and everybody i tell that to are like what are you crazy <laughs> i'm like it just was never for me i never thought he was funny i i find there's so much of it that i still think holds up just the idea of like even the one about uh even when he was talking about how when we landed on the moon and just drove around <laughs> and how there's n no more like there, there's nothing that's more of a of a dude thing to do than fly all the way to space and just drive around <laughs> right right and, and i also love the cleverness of the when he was talking about the uh, about wedding i know i'm just rehashing his material now but <laughs> i hope that there are people here who hear this who have never heard him before and who are or, or who may share your opinion and give him a shot no, but no, i, I love, want people to like dislike him with me if they like him more yeah. power to him i was yeah i i love the joke about how how they dress grooms all the same and uh you know and you're dressed the same as your groomsmen mm -hmm. and how that's why it says do you take this man because <laughs> that way you could just step aside and then the next guy who looks like you can step up which i thought i thought the like the this man i thought that was such like a clever detail to notice and so i you know i liked i liked seinfeld and i describe uh you know the same reason i like seinfeld is the same reason i like hedberg is the same reason i like hicks mm -hmm. which is they stick to their truth whatever that truth is you know that truth doesn't have to be anger about politics like hicks it can be minutia like seinfeld or it can be silliness like hedberg hedberg but they stick to their truth and that's what appeals to me yeah well and i think the the wonderful thing about those voices that you mentioned and 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 i i what i thoroughly enjoy about your work steve is that much like those guys, you know, like Mitch Hedberg is one of my favorites of all time, him and Carlin. And it's just I could sit and try to tell a Mitch Hedberg joke, but it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> it just doesn't. But there's something about him that it does. And, I, you know, I think I did try. I forget what joke it was with my girlfriend. It was one of yours that I saw on your social media. And it's like, yeah, I can't deliver that shit. I can't. I mean, I can do Seinfeld by going. Ah, but it was a bird. 
word, you know, but <laughs> no one can really, you know, deliver it. It's, it's like trying to paint Van Gogh. It's their paintbrush. And, you know, I think that's the brilliance in the art form. Well, I appreciate it. And, you know, one of the things that like, that I want to make clear here is the beauty of comedy is that it is subjective mm -hmm. and like, you can absolutely not find Seinfeld funny. And that doesn't take anything away from how much I enjoy him. Exactly. Um, the, you know, the reason that I was referencing, aside from the fact that, you know, a bunch jumped to mind and I'm just enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. But the reason I was ex explaining it is showing what about it appeals to me. And I think that a lot of times when someone says, I don't like this or I do like this, they don't know why. And I think examining why helps you understand the art better and it helps you understand it helps you find the art that you will like because if you figure out okay what don't you like about seinfeld and then it's like okay well let's find someone then who doesn't do that or who does the opposite of that or etc and so right. i think that it's always it's always so fun to me when someone's just like you're not funny and i'm just like well that's you could tell me the sky is green like i don't <laughs> I don't care. It just makes you look crazy. Objectively, I am funny because I'm a professional comedian and I wouldn't be able to be if I wasn't funny. You don't right. find me funny and that's totally okay. And there are people who are listening to this or who probably shut it off because I think I'm insufferable who don't enjoy me and that's also okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a matter of opinion. And it's like, I don't like Jerry Seinfeld didn't like slap my mom in the face in the past. And that's why I just hate him. <laughs> and, um, I just, yeah, it just wasn't for me. I don't hate the guy. I don't. And even if I did, it doesn't matter. It's not like he's losing any fans. He's going to be just fine. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I, I know what you meant by that sentence, but now I'm picturing Seinfeld as a time traveler who went back in time to slap your mom. To slap <laughs> your mom. Yeah, no, I know. I the best episode of Doctor Who that could exist. So. <laughs> I was just picturing him going, Mikey, fuck you, and driving away in a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, you know? Yeah, I know. Uh, one more, Mikey. All right. Um, top three favorite movies. Top three favorite. Okay. Um, uh, favorite all time is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, uh, then probably Field of Dreams. Oh. And then uh, Breakfast Club. Oh, I love The Breakfast. I love all three of those movies. Can't go wrong. I think all three came out within like a year or two of each other, too. Yep. I'm just stuck in the late 80s on my movie taste. <laughs> That's great right. movies. Hey, welcome to Chloe. Yeah, Feel the Dreams is the one. I mean, come on, every guy. Hey, son, how about a catch? It's like, oh, God, okay. I'm going to go over there. I'll be back. <laughs> Beautiful thing about Feel the Dreams is that like, and I've had people be like, oh, it's a, because of a baseball movie. I'm like, no, because it's a love story. It's a love story between he and his wife. Like, the support that they give each other in that movie is incredible. Um, and it's also a love story between him and his dad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and him trying to find the connection with his dad that he never had. It's such a, it's, you know, and the baseball part of it is fun. But it, it also, my favorite line in the movie, and it's a line that, like, I've never heard anybody else talk about because it's such a teeny little thing, is when they pick up Archie Graham and he introduces himself and he goes, my name's Archie. I play baseball. And the idea that that was how he identified himself immediately to a stranger spoke to me so much. The idea that he has found his identity and that's who he is in that moment because you know later that that's not who he is anymore. And so it just, I, I love that. It's one line and I love it. Yeah. And, and I think it shows that, like you said, in that bond, you know, baseball being the backdrop, but you, you could replace it, you know, with anything. My family, we get together, we talk motorsports. It's like our thing, you know, and it's those yeah. things bond and combined and make, you know, family. And uh, yeah. All right. Now I'm getting all emotional. Yeah, these questions <laughs> weren't so rapid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they were anything but rapid. <laughs> but Steve said I, I wanted his perspective. I got uh, a lot of things to say, guys. That's how, yeah. that's how I've always been. Um, not necessarily your top three comedians, but uh, three comedians. If someone asks you, hey, I'm, I'm just now getting into stand up comedy. Give me three guys or, or three performers, women, men, whatever that I should listen to. What, what do you think? Um, I mean, if I'm going to say, you know, any three, I'm not going to pick contemporary. I'm going to pick, you know, like originals. Um, and I would say Bill Hicks, um, 
Joan Rivers, and Dick Gregory. Uh, Dick Gregory. God, that's one I haven't heard in a long time. Well, Mr. Hofstetter, thanks, man. This has been uh, really great. And we always kind of uh, ask the guests to leave us the uh, last last words. Just anything, maybe if somebody's out there struggling and through your experience in life, you drop some, some knowledge. Anxiety and depression are two of the loneliest feelings in the world. And they're also two of the most common. And so when you realize that as isolated as it makes you feel, how not alone you are in that isolation, you can realize that you could talk to other people about it. There are other people who are going through it. You're not the first person to face it. You're not the only person to face it. More people than you know face it. And so I think realizing that you're not alone is a really good step. Yeah. Love that. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah, absolutely. It. Thanks for having me on.